his name up he deserves all our praise he's the lord of all do you believe it let god hear it give him some praise amen amen uh what a joy it is to gather together our prayer and the purpose is that jesus would be more the center of our lives every day 
Revelation 5 says this, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Let's echo that in our hearts today.
that is we're, it's what we're here for together to worship our God. But the worship doesn't end or begin in this building. It's throughout all of life. Everything you do, even the mundane things, God is intimately involved in your life. Whether you think you're doing awesome right now or you think things are really going awry and you're just wondering why you keep messing up, this is a time to come together and to acknowledge what God has done in the past for his people, including you. He doesn't change and his love in Christ is eternal. We just get to be the ones who put our faith in him and trust that and that his life begins to be lived out in us. So let's make that our commitment now as we sing this song.
so God is in the business of freeing hearts and freeing captives. And again, he does not change. He's not fickle. So as we sing this, let's remind ourselves of it as we lift up the praise for his faithfulness to him. You freed the captives then. You freeing us right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. Lord, we believe that to be true, that you are the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, you don't change. And for you, that is wonderful because you're holy and righteous and complete and just and loving. Lord, we ask for ourselves that we would be changed to be more like you, Lord, to your life in us, less of us, more of you, and that you would be glorified in your people here today and throughout this week and that as we leave this room later today lord that we would still know that you're with us and live in the way that you've called us and we thank you that you hear our prayers because of jesus because of his blood and because of his love for us on that cross and his resurrection and that we know we have an eternity with you but let that begin now in jesus name amen you may be seated. I uh, am blown away often by our worship team. who does such an incredible job of helping to focus our hearts and minds on Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause. Just thanking them for the ministry and the work in our lives. Yeah, so significant. I want to talk to the people that are visiting us this morning, uh, the people that might be here. Maybe it's your first or second time. We just wanna let you know that we are so thankful that you're here to worship our Lord with us. Uh, and I pray that you feel that this is such a welcoming environment where you experience both the love and truth of Jesus Christ. We would like to know that you're here though, and the way that you can do that is you can find this blue Let's Connect card in the chair back in front of you. If you could pull it out, we'd really appreciate it. Fill it out and you can give it to one of those people in the red shirts that say welcome on them. Uh, they'll have a special gift for you, or you can drop it in the boxes near the exit doors on your way out. And what we're going to do with that info is we'll send you an email. Uh, we may call you just asking you if there's anything we can help you with or any questions that we can answer about the church. I also notice, and many of us know this, uh, that this card can also be used to take your next step with the church or your next step with Christ. And so there's information there you can fill out. You can scan that QR code, and I'll take you to all of that stuff. Also, we'll take you to a place where you can give online. Uh, which I know many of you do, and uh, that's uh, great because we support the ministry that Christ is doing in this community, uh, in this region, and throughout the world. But there are also uh, envelopes in the chair backs in front of you. You can uh, take one of those, fill it out, and put it in those boxes near the exit tours if you'd like to support the ministry financially. Now, as you came in, you probably saw all the tables and all the donuts, so you all know this is community group sign-up time, Right? Yeah, that's right. And so we had 750 people sign up so far. Praise God for that. That's, yeah. You are the church, and you're coming together in that Christ-like community to change the world. It's evident, and I know so many of you, and uh, it's just so encouraging that we're all in this ministry together. But for the few of you that haven't signed up yet, there's still so many places where you can come together, uh, have those spiritual relationships that we all need centered around God's word and what he calls us to do and how he empowers us as his people. So I'd ask you to prayerfully consider that after this week, there's two more weeks, then groups begin meeting. Two groups I wanna highlight. Uh, one is in Sandals University, which happens after church on Sundays, and that's the place where we help to equip people in a very special way. Uh, we've got Bible college and seminary professors there and pastors teaching classes, and they're just not academic, it's also relational and missional and helps us live for Christ. But there's one particular, thanks Mary, there's one particular class called Discipleship Essentials, which is if you're new in your faith, or just feel like you need to lay a good foundation, uh, that's there for you. Very special guys teaching that, Dr. Larry Dixon, who's an incredible man of God, will walk beside you and a few other people uh, who just wanna form that foundation uh, to grow in Christ. 
And as a couple, we know marriages are difficult in this world where it's filled with a minefield of addictions and difficulties, but we've got a special thing called a Couples Connect Group where we give you some materials to meet with your spouse 15 minutes a week uh, and just to share things spiritually, learn how to become, for the man, the leader in the family spiritually and lead your family and have that special time with your spouse centered around Jesus and help you to grow deep in their relationship. You can also sign up for that. You've received emails, there's tables out there. Uh, and uh, text messages and all of those things. So pray about that. Uh, and thank you for being part of the body of Christ and living for him. Pastor Jeff is now gonna come out and share with us. Give him a round of applause. Welcome my beloved lead pastor. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. All right, hey, good morning. Good to see you guys. Thanks for coming today. Um, man, some fun stuff to announce to you guys. I, I had said, I mean, months ago that, um, maybe almost a year ago, that, a church across town was closing, and uh, it was formerly known as Denny Terrace Baptist Church, and uh, they gave that church to us. And so uh, we now have been talking as the leadership of the church uh, about how we want to handle it from here, what we want to do from there. And so we're going to make it a church campus, which means it's just it's just Sand Hills in another location. Um, but we're going to, you know, we need a lead guy who's going to be over there. And so we have found a lead guy. And so today I'm going to introduce to you Pastor Jason and his wife Ashley. So what's the big round of applause here? She's on a hide. Huh? She's on a hide. Okay. <laughs> I didn't drag her out here. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to the Sand Hills family. It is uh, it's good to see you guys. And uh, we need to learn a little bit about them. I've gotten to know a little bit about them, but you don't uh, yet. So let's talk about some of this. So Ashley, we'll let you start. Tell us a little bit about you, your honey, your kids. Oh, you still got your kids here, right? Well, a couple of them anyway. They're scattered Yeah. Right now. Oh, there you are. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> All right. So tell us about your family. Um, okay, I'm Ashley. I have five kids, or we have five kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have twins that are 12, an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 6-year-old. I lied to the last congregation and said that he was 7, but he's not. He's 6. <laughs> but if you ask him, he's probably 30. So, yeah. um, We've been married 13 years That's and been time. together 15 years. All right, all right. Yes, I got it right this time. Um, and yeah, that's about, that's about it. That's us. All right, so I, one of the stories I like already about you guys is the story of how you met. So can you please share with us how you guys met? This is so funny. I'm going to tell the truth. If you talk to him anywhere outside of this, he's probably going to lie to you. Um, but I'll tell the real story. So we met through my brother, actually. He was one of my brother's friends. Ended up being my cousin's roommate. Um, and when I graduated high school, I joined his college ministry. I uh, went a couple times. I think the third time I went, he had a sign-in sheet, which I was like, why? You didn't do this two weeks ago, but okay. Um, had a sign-in sheet. I signed it, and later that night, he texted me, and I was like, where did you get my number from? He said, from the sign-in sheet, and I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> so, oh my God. So that's how we met. At the end of the last service, my daughter was like, dad has W Riz. I don't know if you guys have 12-year-olds, but... Yeah, my daughter thinks he has W Riz, but I have to disagree. All right, so I, I mean, I don't know if some of you single guys out there just learned something, uh, but it is, it is time to host a Bible study, have all the ladies sign in, and just pick the one you want. That's how it works. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it might be sl uh, slightly off color, but uh, apparently effective. So, all right, it worked, it worked. All right, so Brother Jason, we want to learn a little bit about you. Uh, so just for, start with some fun stuff. Tell us, uh, like, maybe uh, favorite uh, food that you love or uh, hobbies or favorite football team, something like that. All right, so one thing my wife didn't share with y'all, and if you guys don't know already, but we are from California. So, all right. So we're from Cali. Uh, we moved here from San Diego. I'm originally from the Bay Area, and my wife is from Fresno. Um, so we like Mexican food. We absolutely love Mexican food. Yeah. We love tacos, so that would be our favorite, well, my favorite food. Yes, real tacos. I haven't said that every service. <laughs> real tacos, not Moe's, not uh, anything else. Yeah. It's not San Jose's. Yeah. Real tacos. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we love tacos. Um, my hobby is uh, I'm an aquarist, not an Aquarius. I'm an aquarist, so I have a 75-gallon um, fish tank at home that I care for. So that's my hobby. I like doing that. And then my favorite football team, for the record, 
make sure everyone knows when I first get here and I ain't jump on no bandwagon, I'm a 49er fan through and through. Through and through. So we all know that Jeff is a... <laughs> we know Jeff is a, a Chiefs fan, so... Yeah. So there's some... So, as, you know, our teams have played each other, and I've enjoyed the games. Uh, <laughs> it's been fun. I mean... <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't disclose this before we met, uh, like, yeah. officially and talked about the job. I hired here. you first, yeah. then was like, yeah. hey, you should probably know. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right. So talking about now that you're working with us, where were you guys before here? Where were you working before this? So we've actually been here in Columbia for the past five... Well, November will be five years. Mm -hmm. The last four and a half years we spent serving at North Trenton Baptist. So I was the next-gen pastor at North Trenton Baptist for the last mm -hmm. four and a half years. Amen. Amen. So, actually, one of the things I think is pretty cool about this is, you know, we didn't steal y'all from uh, North Trenton. Right. So, uh, Pastor Casey, who's a friend of mine over there, he called me when he heard that we were going to be working with Denny Terrace. And he's like, hey, listen, um, you need to talk to one of my pastors over here named Jason. Like, I know God's put within him the gifts to be a lead guy somewhere, and I just think you should talk to him. So I thought that was really cool that your senior pastor would contact me. Now, I don't know if he was trying to get rid of you, but, uh, <laughs> but that he would call me and be like, hey, you need, you need to talk to this brother. So, um, so that's been cool. And then, Ashley, tell us what you do. You, what's your job? So I'm the area director. If anyone's familiar with Young Life, I am the area director of Young Lives. <laughs> Um, and Young Lives is a ministry that serves teen parents in our community, and I've been doing this now for four years, which is crazy. Um, but we mentor and disciple teen moms and dads here in our city, and if you're familiar with Young Life, we go to camp, we do club and campaigners and all the things. That's a great ministry. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and then uh, just for you, like, as you're headed to this new campus, again, what we've talked about, it's going to be an extension of Sand Hills. Um, we'll, you'll be the preacher over there, right? You'll be the campus pastor. Um, but what are you most excited about as uh, you're heading this out? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of things I'm excited about. Well, if I can narrow it down to one thing is um, driving over there and knowing that the community has been driving by this church for the past several years and there's been nothing going on there. Um, empty parking lot, uh, maybe some overgrown grass. Um, that's on par for the neighborhood, but uh, <laughs> but we um, being able to be there and, and bring some life back to that community. I'm, I'm super excited about that. Amen. And just the hope of Jesus um, back to that area, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. I think there's a lot of work to do, but I'm I'm really excited that we get to be a part of in some ways reviving that. Amen. That Amen. Yeah, I'm excited about that too. And I one of the things I love, like this congregation, like. We're going to mobilize. Like, we're going to, we're, we're here. We're, let's do this thing. But how can we connect with you? How can we, you know, let you know we're interested, want to partner with you? Right. So, first off, we got a lot to do at uh, Diddy Terrace. There's a lot of renovations that need to happen. There's a lot of care um, that the, the church needs. There, some TLC, really, is what it needs. And then some other, like, big things that need to happen as well. But I will be in the lobby at the uh, end of service. You guys can also... I think we got a QR code that you guys can scan right now. But all this is doing is, uh, I've been telling every service, this isn't saying, hey, I'm going to join the Denny Terrace campus at San Diego. That's not what this is. This is saying we need your help. And I've been also telling everybody that this, as Jeff said, is an extension of the Northeast campus. And so we're all family. This isn't Jeff sending us over there and he's going to say, hey, PJ, let me know if there's something you need. And then uh, we'll try to help out with that. No. We are doing this together. You guys right. are our family now. That's right. So, amen, amen, brother, yeah. amen. I'm excited about it. Well, I think it's, we're about to have, Sand Hills, we're about to have a lot of fun uh, as we take hundreds of us and descend upon the DT area and, uh, and bring Jesus afresh uh, to that community. Some of y'all live over there, and I've already had some of y'all reach out to me and say, like, hey, when this thing starts, I want to be involved. So, like, I'm pumped about it. This is great, but let's, let's stop and let's uh, talk to the one who brought it to us in the first place. Amen. Amen. Father God, thank you so much. What a privilege and an honor. Uh, this is not us inviting you to do something in this place that we've discovered. This is you inviting us to be a part of what you have planned for Denny Terrace. Lord, we are pumped. We're excited. We love the proclamation 
explanation of the gospel. Lord, there are people living there right now who have no clue what's about to happen in their lives as the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ, is about to transform them, their families, their neighborhood, and we get to be a part of it all. Lord, and you have brought this couple blessed by your hand, Jason, Ashley, their beautiful family. Uh, Lord, and you have a plan for them, and we're going to rally together, and we're going to watch Jesus do something remarkable. Father, I pray you will pour out your blessing on them. I pray that you will provide for them, and I pray that there will be a group of people that rally around them and start a beautiful work in this community. And we thank you in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I mean, we could just stop right now and go home. God's working, right? Uh, but while we're here, why don't we study some scripture? If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open up to the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 19 today. 2 Samuel chapter 19. And I have loved our journey through First and 2 Samuel. We're almost done, so you gotta, gotta savor these last few chapters. Um, so some good stuff going on. Now, if you're newer with us or you've kind of forgotten where we are in the story for the last uh, couple weeks, uh, we've had some other guys preaching. Uh, pastors uh, Tom and Craig preached a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Croto preached last week some remarkable sermons. Um, but this week, we're gonna jump back into 2 Samuel. So we are on the second king of Israel. The second king of Israel is David. The first king was Saul. Saul was a bad king. Uh, God turned his back on him because Saul disobeyed him. And I mean, just, you know, common knowledge, we should all know this. Like, when you rebel against the Lord, bad things happen in your life, all right? Let's just get that out there. And so that's what happened with Saul. Bad things happen in his life. Well, then David steps in, and David is following the Lord, and God has blessed him, and great things are going on. He's, he's uh, accomplishing new things, getting new territory. He's building wealth. But then he gets full of himself, and as he gets proud, and he loses his humility before the Lord, he stumbles and he sins. And he doesn't just, I mean, he big sins. Like, like he, he commits adultery with a woman, and then being worried that he's going to be found out, he makes sure that her husband gets killed in battle. And so really, he murders the husband at war. It's a horrible thing. And God brings him punishment and discipline, and he does it through a prophet. And a prophet comes to him and says, uh, among a, no a number of punishments, one is, the sword will now therefore never depart from your home, which means that you now are going to suffer at the hands of others who will bring death and destruction into your life for the rest of your life. And this evil will rise up from within your own home. So it is just, it's it's chaos, it's a nightmare, and this thing actually happened. His son Absalom rebelled against him, rose up, and convinced all of Israel to turn and to follow him. And so Absalom raises up the armies of Israel, comes after David, David who's in Jerusalem, and has spent so much time building up Jerusalem that he doesn't want to see the city destroyed, flees with his supporters. And I don't know how many people it was, maybe a thousand-ish kind of people, but, I mean, Absalom is bringing the armies of Israel against David, and so he flees. But when David gets outside of the city, the people rally around him. And so there's this huge civil war that develops. And Absalom and his armies rise up against David and his armies, um, and then something crazy happens. So here's the thing about Absalom. Absalom was a young man, and he had some amazing hair. Right? We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Any of you young men out there, you got a head full of hair, just praise God. It don't last. Right? Uh, you, just enjoy it while you can. It's going to be short-lived, but you'll, you'll enjoy it. So, uh, but Absalom is riding by himself during the war, riding by himself th uh, through a thick forest area. An oak is there. His hair gets caught in an oak tree. Uh, and the donkey he's riding goes out from under him. And then he's just <laughs> hanging there uh, all by himself. And one of David's soldiers sees it, comes back and tells David's general, Joab, says, you're never going to believe this, but Absalom is hanging in a tree, unguarded, undefended. i like, I can't believe it. And so Joab, the general, says, well, did you kill him? And the man said, oh, you know, you know I can't kill him because King David himself said, while we're at war against Absalom and we want to win, we have to make sure we don't kill Absalom. Those were David's orders. And Joab's like, I cannot believe you. We're at war. I'll do this myself. And so then Joab shows up, and I mean, <laughs> he really kills him. I mean, <laughs> I know you think like, you just kill something. No, he for real, for real kills him a lot. Uh, and so he's all dead for sure uh, by the time Absalom. And then word gets back to David. And like, so the, the battle's over. I mean, David's won. His army's won. And David, instead of celebrating and high-fiving his soldiers and thank you, everybody, you defended my life, we're heading back to take the throne, instead of all of that, David's heart is broken because his son is dead. And so what should be a victory celebration turns into a funeral march back to Jerusalem. And they walk in with their heads low, David's crying, he's mourning the loss of his son, and we're in 2 Samuel chapter 19. 
It was told Joab, behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day the king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. All right, so first of all, let's start with this. David is just... He is just a broken king. He is a broken king. And as a broken king, he's not processing well. He's not thinking well. And he feels like the the fallen Absalom and all of his sin against Israel is really because of him. And in some ways, he's probably right. In some ways, he's probably like his sin did cause this succession of sin. Now, that doesn't mean that Absalom is innocent before the Lord. Absalom is guilty of his own sin. Uh, but because David is so broken right now, it's ruined everything about him, including his perspective. He's got a broken perspective as well. Uh, that is, he's blaming himself. He's not doing what he should be doing. Uh, and what he needs right now in this moment is he needs somebody to speak some truth to him. And that's what's going to happen when his general shows up to have a conversation in verse 5. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, you have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased." Now, therefore, arise, go out, and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Wow. You want to talk about dropping some truth. And this is on the king. You don't don't talk to kings this way, right? You don't, because they can smack you around. They can put you in prison. They can kill you. You don't talk that way. But Joab, this is what we know about Joab. Now, Joab has got his own issues. He does, to be fair. He's rebellious, and whatever he sees is right, he does it, whether or not somebody else agrees with him or not. He's headstrong, but this is what we know about him. He says what he thinks he needs to say, and he does what he thinks he needs to do. And at this point, his king is not in a good place. And so he comes to his king, and he just, he just dresses him down. And he's, he comes, what are you thinking? These people have offered their lives to you. Some of them have paid. They've lost relatives to defend you, to, to win back the throne. And you treat them like you don't care about them. You're not showing them any love. And then, I, and then he gets real serious. He goes, I swear to you, if you don't fix this right now, none of us are staying with you. And this will be the worst thing that ever happens in your entire life. I mean, I would love to have been in that throne room to see that whole thing go down. Uh, and, and this is the thing. Okay, we, all of us, all of us, from time to time, we need a truth teller, right? Because there's things we feed ourselves sometimes that are garbage. And there are things that other people feed us sometimes that's also garbage. And we need sometimes somebody just to speak truth to us, just to tell me what I need to hear. Now, here's the thing. You're going to tell me what I need to hear, but I don't want to hear it right? So you've had people speak truth to you, right? From time to time. So I married my truth teller. Uh, uh, so <laughs> she's great. she loves me. She loves me, but she speaks the truth. She'll tell me a lot, you know, honey, I just want you to know you're not as great as you think you are. Uh, you know, and I, I need to hear it at times. So here's how I respond to truth. I'll be honest. When I hear truth, this is how I respond. My first response, when you come and you rebuke me, hey, you need to hear this. My first response is, listen, I already know I'm right. I'm just trying to figure out how you're wrong. Right? That's, that's how I respond to truth. Uh, but then, and then I'll pull back from the situation, and normally then God does some business with me. It's like, hey, you need to listen. I'm, I'm sending you a messenger. Uh, and so then I come back, I try to fix it, and then I do it. But I don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear truth. And so sometimes I'm the receiver of it. Sometimes I'm the giver of it. So on both sides of that, let me, let me give you a word. Because sometimes God's going to put you in a situation where he wants you to say something hard to somebody. And it's going to be hard to do, but you're going to realize at some moment you're just going to have to bring some truth. In, on both sides of that, whether you're the one bringing the truth or you're the one receiving the truth, can I just ask this? Please do so with humility. Do so when, when somebody comes at you, even if you're not sure you agree with them right away, just do this. Do this. Hey, listen, I know you feel like you had to say that to me. Let me just process it a little bit. Let me reflect on that a little bit, and I'll, I'll get back to you. You know, you don't have to you know, make a big decision right then. Or if you're the one bringing truth, don't, don't come in <laughs> all cocky, like, you know, you and God got this thing, and you just drop this truth on them. You're like, mic drop, yo. You know, like, no, no, stop, stop. Dial it back. You're not all that. You know, God's going to use you. Do it with humility, because you hate to hear stuff, too, sometimes that you need to hear. So just 
act like you understand where they're coming from and do it with some humility. And uh, I don't know that Joab captures all that, uh, but he does bring this truth and it works. And this is the thing about truth. When people drop truth on us and we know we needed to hear it, we can actually change. We can actually make a difference. And that's what happens here. Look at verse eight. Then the king arose, he took his seat in the gate and the people were all told, behold, the king is sitting in the gate and all the people came back before the king. So here's what's going on here. Like the king had just stepped out of his duties. He's so broken, he's so sad, he's mourning what's going on. He's like, I just can't deal with this, my son's dead. And Joab comes to him, he's like, what are you doing? You're not even being a king. These people risk their lives for you. And after the rebuke, David's like, he's right. I hate it, but he's right. And so he's like, all right, let's get back to work. And so he shows up back at the city gate. The city gate means the king's accessible again. And, and people are breathing a sigh of relief, like, okay. I, th- I thought things were gonna go real bad there, but he's, he seems cool. He's getting, back, uh, getting things back together. And so there's some normalcy returning, but not to all of Israel. All of Israel is really jacked up right now. Uh, so go now to verse nine, uh, right before it. it says, now Israel had fled every man to his own home and all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, the king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and he saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom, but Absalom who we anointed over us is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? So now this is really interesting. Uh, this is like... You ever quit a job that you realize after you quit it, you shouldn't have quit it? Like, you're like, that was a bad call. <laughs> like, I had a great job. Or this is like, you know, breaking up with somebody that you realize you probably should have married. Uh, not true for those of you who are married. Whoever you married, you married the right one. I just want to get that out. But like, the, like this decision I shouldn't have made, like this is that. This is like all of Israel going, Absalom, Absalom's our new man. We're behind Absalom. And then Absalom gets slaughtered and his army gets wiped out. And you're like, ooh. Like, oh, we made a bad call, right? And so David's come back to the throne. And the question you should be asking yourself is what's to happen now with us? We rebel. What's the king gonna do to us? In his right, he can wipe us out. He can arrest us. Like, you, got, you don't know what's gonna happen here. Now, here's another thing. Before you go into this, you gotta have a little background. Sometimes in scripture, in the Old Testament, and in this passage, you will hear a description of Israel, and then you'll also hear mention of Judah. Now, if you've ever looked at a map of Israel, you might rightly conclude Isn't Judah a part of Israel? All right, they are. Judah is a a part of Israel, but Judah is the rebellious tribe of Israel that thinks they're kind of better from everybody else and not quite a part of the the rest of Israel. This is what I've been saying. I've said this before. Like, Judah is the Texas of Israel. Like... Like, we're with y'all, but at any time, we might leave, right? And, and we can take care of ourselves down here, right? So that's Judah. That's Judah's like that. So, but here's the thing, too. Like, David is actually from Judah. That's his people. And Judah is really struggling to receive him or not. Uh, in fact, we know Jesus is uh, from the line of David. And so uh, Jesus has this really cool name. He's called uh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah right? So, like, that's... That's his people. But Israel as a whole has finally said, like, we were stupid. We shouldn't have done that. that we're back in. And, uh, but Judah's like, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. So David's got to talk to them. Now, verse 11. King David sent this message to Zadok and Tobiathar, the priests. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You're my bone, my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, all right, hold on. Before we go into all this, let's talk about Amasa. All right, so we've got Joab. Joab, this is weird. This is all family stuff going on here. Joab is David's nephew. And David has made him the commander of his army. He's the general. And uh, Joab, we know him. He's the truth teller. He does what needs to be done, even if nobody agrees with him. That's Joab. All right, on the other side of this is Amasa. Amasa was Absalom's general. Like 10 minutes ago, Amasa was trying to wipe out David and everybody he knew, right? Right? So that's who Amasa is. And so now David has a word for Amasa who's from the tribe of Judah. And this is what he says to him. And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. What? what? <laughs> yeah, if you're Joab, you're like, are you kidding me? You know, like, after all that I've done for you. See, this would be a great moment to have King David, Joab, Amasa uh, in a room together and just to hear them kind of talk this out. Uh, because this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. So what's going on here? All right, now, first of all, uh, I hope Joab doesn't take this poorly. Uh, I hope he can deal with this. Has anybody read all of Second Samuel? 
Yeah, they're about to have another conversation, Joab and Amasa, but we'll wait for that. That's another chapter from now. Uh, but here we are. So uh, Joab will be losing his mind. And now here's the thing about David. I think if, if, if Joab were to come to David and go, David, how could you do this? After I've been there for you, I've always done what's needed to be done. I'm the guy you could count on. I've always had your back. And I think David would say, Joab, listen, <laughs> I hate you. I am so mad at you. You killed my son. And you're right. You're right to do so. And I still hate you for it. I think that would have been the conversation. And, and so here's the deal. You're a man who always does what's need to, what needs to be done. I haven't lost all my strength. I'm gonna do what needs to be done, and I need Judah back as a part of Israel, and I need their support. So I'm gonna do what needs to be done. And so he does. He, he pulls off this crazy thing. And so then Amasa hears this, and then Judah hears this, and then it changes the hearts uh, of all of them. Go to verse 14. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, return, both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. All right, so there's something going on here, and it's gonna cause a problem. I'm gonna tell you right now, and then we'll see it at the end of the story. So Judah's like, we're not sure we want you. David does all his thing, a massive promoted, Joab de demoted. Uh, and then uh, they're like, oh, all right, so you are our king. Okay, well, then we're gonna let you be our king. So everybody turns and they're like, hey, we got your back, but here's what we want you to do. We want you to come down here, we want you to meet us, and then we're all gonna walk together to Jerusalem. And so they're gonna, <laughs> he's gonna come down and they're gonna march back to Jerusalem in the broader part of Israel. Um, but, but here's the thing, Judah's always been kind of the rebellious people, and Israel is gonna be insulted by the fact that Judah walks them back to Jerusalem. We'll hit that before the chapter is out. But it's just a minute. You know, can I just say, when we read the Bible, don't we see some messy people in the Bible? Aren't you glad you're not in the Bible? <laughs> I mean, just a bunch of mess. I don't want other people learning from my life. All right. So uh, they're going through this. They're trying to figure this out. So now here's the thing. When David was leaving, there are a bunch of people that got real cocky when David was leaving. They got real full of themselves. And one is this guy named, uh, it's probably Shimei is his name. Uh, I call him Shmi. I think it's derogatory a bit and I like it. Um, uh, or if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, he's the Smeagol of the group. Uh, but anyway, he's just a bad dude. So King David, you get this picture. King David is leaving Jerusalem. He's got, uh, like, he's got his special forces guys surrounded him. Uh, it's about a thousand people. It's his family, all this kind of stuff. So they're walking in a procession, and it's horrible. He, he's lost the throne, and probably in his head, everything's over. I've lost everything. I'm out of here. And so he's marching away, and then this worthless man gets up on the ridge of this hill as they're walking by, and he starts throwing rocks <laughs> at the king and his soldiers, which, first of all, not the wisest guy, right? He's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he's firing these, uh, these rocks down at him, and then he's cursing the king. You can imagine that? He's cursing David and his soldiers as they're leaving, and he's saying, you're getting what you deserve. You shouldn't have been king in the first place. And then a bunch of expletives thrown in there. Like, just a bad dude. And so, then this is David, and David's like, hey, you know, let's not do this, and, because one of his soldiers steps up, a guy named Abishai, and Abishai's like, king, you give me the word, and I will separate that head from those shoulders. You just, you tell me what. And uh, David's like, just, dude, dial it back. We're not gonna worry about that. Let's just leave. So they leave, and uh, nothing happens. So now, David's on his way back. And he's about to meet that dude again. So here we go, uh, verse 16. And Shimei, uh, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, from Baharim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, they rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan, and he said to the king, let not my Lord hold me guilty, or remember how your servant did wrong on that day, my Lord, the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned, therefore. Behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my Lord, the king. All right, so let's talk about what's going on here. Shimei knows David's coming back to the throne and he's in trouble. Like he was cursing the king and David's coming back to power. 
And so Shimei runs down. He's got some of his boys with him. Uh, Ziba's another guy connected to Mephibosheth, if you remember that story. So, uh, but I love it. So Shimei runs down. He's like, hey, hey, up, Dude, my bad. My bad. I mean, you know, first of all, I was having a weird day, really weird day. It's kind of hot out. I got kind of crazy. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I'll tell you this. You know who loves this boy? I love you. I came here. I'm the first of all the people to let you know how much I love you. So if you're going to judge me of anything, you're going to judge me because I love you so much. I'm here. I brought some of my boys with me, and I just want to tell you, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I'm so glad you're back. Welcome back to your kingdom, right? All right. So I love this too, because I mean, this is just, this dude's a worm. But this is, this is what happens with people, right? We see this in our world all the time. Like you're all full of yourself until the tide turns and then you gotta figure something out. So suddenly now you're the best friend to the guy you just hated. So that's what's going on here. He shows up here. And then I love, so Abishai. Abishai is David's right-hand man, a soldier who is a, a, a fierce warrior. And this is what he does, verse 21. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? <laughs> but David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be an, as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. All right, so here's the deal. So this is Abishai, same Abishai. And if you read these two chapters where both these events happen, David uses the same words. So Abishai comes up and he's like, this dude <laughs> is the lowest of the low. Like, you give the word, king, I will slaughter him right now. And so when we talked about this last time, David says to Abishai, and this is kind of true. So like, Abishai, listen, dude, you're always here. I need you here, all right? I, can't, I just need you to bring this back a little bit. And so he comes back. He's like, I'll, do it. I'll take him out now. David's like, Abishai, dude, come on. You're here again. I need you back here. I'll just let's dial it back a little bit. But, but David does something here that I think is a good model for us in this. So here's, here comes David, and he could. He could he's a king. He could kill uh, uh, Shimei if he wanted to, uh, but he doesn't want to. And this is, for me, how I view evil and I view God's people. So evil people, for me, are like the lowest rung of life. They're, they just... They're, they're horrible people, they're, they're hateful, and they want to hurt and ruin the people's lives around them. That's, that's just how they're wired. Now, God's people, for me, top rung uh, uh, of the ladder uh, in this world, like the, the totally separate people. So here's the problem with interacting with evil people. So this is a warning to all of us as evil people, because you're going to meet evil people all the time, and some of y'all got evil people in your life right now, right? And all they want to do is they want to hurt you, they want to affect you, and they want to ruin your life. Evil people have nothing to lose. They got nothing to lose. They're going to throw rocks at you. They're going to curse you. Uh, they just want to make you mad. They want to make you angry. They want to hurt you. They want to wound you. But we can't respond to them in kind because we as God's people, we do have something to lose. Like, they don't. We do. We know this, that the hand of God is upon me and God has forgiven me from so much because I am such a sinful person. Right? God has shown such grace to me. And I would love to judge these people. I'd love to condemn these people. But God's forgiven me so much. How can I now throw judgment at these people? I can't do that. I can't do that. And I've got, I've got to walk with God I've got to worry about. And he's going to judge me if I turn on people like that. So I can't become like that. Uh, here's another thing I know. I have a reputation. I have a reputation as a man who proclaims faith in Christ. What's the world going to see if I'm turning out and I'm cursing this dude over here? Or I'm trying to ruin his life? Like, no, I can't do that. Like, I've got, I've got to maintain this witness I've got because I'm the one who proclaims the grace of Christ. Also this, I once was just like that. I once was the evil person, and God showed me mercy through Christ. I can't do that. So there's all sorts of reasons we can't return this. And in this moment, David says, listen, don't I know I'm king? I don't have to submit myself to this fool over here. I have an entire country that I get to lead because God has shown me favor. Why would, I, why would I deal with somebody like that? Let that go. We'll let God deal with him. Uh, by the way, God does deal with him later, but that's, a, that's another story. You've got to read 1 Kings. All right, so, so here we are. So David's going back. Now at this point, as David's coming back, he reconciles with several people, and we can't go into all of it right now. Uh, Mephibosheth, uh, there's a great story with Mephibosheth, which is in the next part of this uh, chapter. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Barzillai uh, that was a foreigner that showed kindness uh, to David, and then David rewards that kindness. But I do want to draw your attention to the end of 2 Samuel, then we'll wrap up some things here. 2 Samuel, verse 41 uh, this is chapter 19. Uh, then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king. Now, again, Israel, not Judah. This is the other people. Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all of David's men with him? And the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is our close relative. 
Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten it all at the king's expense? Or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king and in David. Uh, also, we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So here's what you need to see here. They still hate each other. They, it's a war now for who loves David more. So, like they were just fighting David like 10 minutes ago, but it's just it's a crazy thing. Um, here's the thing. That's going to play itself out in the next couple chapters. Uh, that, that, that anger, that fierceness, that hatred. But uh, we're not going to go into that right now. What we are going to talk about is some lessons we can learn as we study this. Now, the first lesson I think we need to learn, uh, as I would say it, is just the value of a rebuke, the value of a good rebuke. We need from time to time a good rebuke. Let me share with you a scripture. I love this scripture. Uh, this comes from the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of the enemy. All right, so this is what I love about this verse here. This verse tells us this. Those closest to you from time to time will speak truth to you. And it's going to anger you. It's going to break your heart. It's going to frustrate you. may make you cry. It's going to be tough. But what they give to you is a gift that you need to value. And it is much better than somebody who hates you, who just pours praise upon you about how great and wonderful you are. We need to value the treasure of a good rebuke. You're going to hate it, but it's good for you. It can change your life. It can change your world. And, uh, and David gets that. Here's something else David gets, and this is my second lesson I'd say we learned from this, is the idea of the gracious winner, the gracious winner. Now, he's, the war has turned. David has all rights to punish people, discipline people, execute people, and he doesn't do it. All he wants to do is get this kingdom back to a kingdom of peace. Now, there's a practical reason. As a king, you need people. <laughs> you got to have people to fight your wars. You got to have people to farm your land. You got to have people to uh, make money, make babies. You need all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're also reminded of a biblical principle that Jesus teaches us. Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 43 through 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, at least God makes it easy on us. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, here's the great thing about uh, being a believer. You may not have to be perfect, but Christ is. And as you connect with him, as you follow him, as you submit your life to him, his perfection bleeds over into your life, and then he works out through you his glory and his good to a perfect end. But uh, as we walk through this morning, I think probably we've all been convicted. Uh, I know I am, and I think this is what makes David so great in all this. We, it's hard to relate to David in some ways. In other ways, it's real easy. There's a broken man, broken by his own sin, forgiven by God. That's something we can all relate to. Father God, thank you so much this moment just to reflect on your truth, to reflect on your scripture. Oh, Lord, where would we be without your grace shown to us? And Lord, we cannot be like this unrighteous man we read about today, this Shimei, who, who just gets so full of himself, gets so cocky, and all he wants to do is wound and to hurt uh, and then offer a false humility. Whereas David, who realizes he's sinned against you, is just so grateful that you're restoring him, that he doesn't want to bring this harsh judgment on others. He just wants to bring back peace to his world. So, Father, may we be like David in that way. May we be peace bringers. But, Lord, we're peace bringers through Christ, which means we proclaim his goodness, his salvation, and the treasure of what we can have in our eternal Father, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when you hear stories like that, when you hear what God has done in the past and what he's called us to, it's often, and as a matter of fact, it's always contrary to our natural inclinations, you know, the things that we think for justice for us and um, how we view others. And But God has called us to follow him and put aside our ways of thinking and begin to think like he does. You know, I read this uh, quote by Tim Timothy Keller, who was a pastor in New York City years ago, um, and uh, Jackie Hill Perry 
quote, it, and it was really, it really struck me hard. And it says, God does not give us exactly what we ask for, but he gives us what we would ask for if we knew everything he knew. And so that's one of those things that we have to trust God in following him. So as we think about the life of David, think about what it means to us and how God interacts with us, again, it all comes down to trusting God and putting our faith into practice in obedience and love. So I invite you now to stand and we'll make this commitment in this song and make this our prayer for us. to be the ones who follow you. We want to be those who are called by your name and that it can be seen in our lives 
that we are not like we used to be. We are not like the world is, but we are like our Lord, our Savior. We're like Jesus. Work your life in us. Let us decrease that you would increase more. Be near us now and help us to continue to live this life as we walk out these doors and that this world would be changed because of that. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're dismissed, if you need prayer for anything, there will be uh, elders and prayer team members here at the front. And also tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in this room, we are having corporate prayer, so come on down. Have a great week.